was really thrilled when I was asked to come and speak here about sleep. Not many people ask me to talk about sleep. Um, because I'm an unashamed lover of sleep. I can't describe my feelings for sleep any better than Shakespeare did over 400 years ago, when he said, sleep, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. As far as priorities go, it's pretty high up there for me. But I think I'm one of a growing minority because the research tells me very clearly that lots of us aren't getting the sleep that we require. So I often do this when I give a talk. Show of hands, those of you who regularly on a weeknight get less than seven hours sleep. Okay, so you're not up here. <laughs> I can tell you that ups really upsets me because about 40% of people, I would say, put up their hands. So that means that 40% of you, or four out of 10, aren't getting the seven to nine hours sleep that we require and that we know is recommended for optimal physical and um, mental health. Now, if I had asked that question of 50 years ago, there would hardly have been a show of hands because we know in the 1960s, people were getting round about 8.5 hours sleep on an average. If we compare that to 2014, people are now averaging, the working adult is averaging 6.7 hours. Now that's a reduction of 20% in our sleep time. So I don't think I'm that much different to my grandparents. Sure, I'm, I could be on the internet 24-7 if I want and I can travel much more easily. But as a biological being, my needs haven't changed. And in fact, we know biology doesn't work that quickly. <coughs> So if my biology, biological requirements haven't changed, why did my grandparents sleep so much? Was it because they were bored, they didn't have the net? Like, that's why we don't sleep. Or did they sleep because that's what they needed? And indeed, it's this generation that is missing on something really fundamental. So I'm gonna look at that question today, and I really wanna leave everyone here with a very clear idea that sleep is fundamental to our good health and well-being. All right, so what kills a rat the quickest? Is it lack of water, lack of food, or sleep, or lack of food? Indeed, if I deprive a rat totally of water, it will die around about day 14. Totally deprive of food around about day 19, but sleep around about day 17. So the rat's need for sleep falls squarely between the need for water and food. It is fundamental to their living. Now, ethics won't let me do that experiment on us, <laughs> but we're pretty sure, and we know from the research, that sleep is fundamental to our health. So, we know in the short term, if we don't get the right amount of sleep, we're more vulnerable to developing colds and flus, and we know that anecdotally. Long term, we're much more likely to develop a chronic disease, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and some forms of cancer. Now, there's a number of reasons why that is so, but one of the ones that is emerging is a very clear link between lack of sleep and weight gain. Now, intuitively, we might think that the longer we're awake, the less weight we will have on because we've got longer time to exercise. But indeed, the reverse is the opposite. The less we sleep, the more likely we are to put on weight and to find it difficult to gain weight, uh, to lose weight. The reason for this is our body goes into protection mode. It changes the profile of our appetite hormones. It gives us more of the hormone that makes us feel hungry and less of the hormone that makes us feel full. In real terms, that means we want to eat between 350 to 500 calories extra per day. So very quickly, we end up overweight. Now, it's no surprise, but it's not very much recognised that the de decline in sleep since 1960 has followed an increase in weight or has preceded the increase in weight. And we now have a nation, 64% of Australians are now overweight or obese. And we know obesity or our weight actually contributes to the chronic disease states. So sleep is vital for our physical health. But it's not just our physical health. Sleep is vital for our mental health. But to understand why, we need to understand a little bit more about sleep. So here we have on the vertical axis the different um, neurobehavioral states. So everyone's aware of wakefulness, we have a particular brainwave activity, we have particular behavioral characteristics. We also have 
REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, or dream sleep. It's all the same thing, different names. And then you'll see that we also have the non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, and that's divided into three different stages. So stages one and two are our light sleep, and stage three is our deep sleep. This is a very restorative time of uh, our 24-hour period. So how we go to sleep is we start at wakefulness and we go through light sleep, we then dive down into deep sleep, and then we pop up into REM sleep. The first cycle of the night has a lot of deep sleep in it, and then we have only a short cycle or a short amount of REM sleep in the first cycle. Now, we repeat this cycle over and over again. So we're meant to get five complete full sleep, sleep cycles as an adult. So all of those out there who put their hands up to less than seven hours, you are cheating yourself of one sleep cycle. The issue then comes, is this important? Well, what we're meant to get as adults is around about one to one and a half hours of deep sleep. It's a very restorative time uh, for our body and it's absolutely essential for our metabolic health. As we get older, we get less of this type of sleep because basically our body doesn't want to repair us as much, unfortunately. However, we can upregulate up our deep sleep if we exercise, that's so very important. We also meant to have between one and a half to two hours rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep. This is vital for our cognitive health and we also get less and less REM sleep as we get older. But one way we can upregulate REM sleep is to do something complex and challenging like learn a new language, um, new, a new musical instrument or dancing. Dancing is fantastic as well. We also have throughout the night brief periods of wakefulness. Now this is totally normal, but for some people it's very stressful when they wake up in the middle of the night and they get quite concerned and then they therefore find it difficult to get back to sleep. But once people realise about 5% of your total sleep time can be spent in wakefulness, it takes the worry out of it and often people can go back to sleep quite easily. Alright, so that's what we aim for. When people come and see me, this is what I want to see, this lovely consolidated sleep cycles, five of them, not four, five. So here we have this lovely sleeping cat. Is it asleep or awake or is it pretending? Behaviourally, it looks like it's asleep, but I'm not sure because I don't know what's happening with the brain. So when you come into my sleep lab, I'll find out because I put electrodes on your head and I put electrodes on your eyes so I know what's happening with your eyes and I also put lots of other monitors on you. And so what we want to look at is what's happening with your brain waves. So here we have the awake brain, quite fast activity there, you can see very clearly. The light sleep brain has a much slower brain activity, mixed amplitude. We go into deep sleep, look at those beautiful, consistent, lovely deep waves. This is where we. Um, secreting all that gorgeous growth hormone. And then we have REM sleep. So you can't fox me. I know what stage of sleep that you are in when you're in my lab. So you'll see the very, very great similarity between the brainwave activity of the awake brain and the brainwave activity of the REM brain. Now, when this was first discovered some 50, 60 years ago, the researchers couldn't get their data published because it was unthinkable that the a sleep brain was as active as the awake brain. They were told to go back and redo their data because it was artifact. They had to do it two times more. They finally got published, which is great. So we now accept that the brain is very active in REM sleep. But we don't have to so much rely now on EEG activity to know that our brain is very active when we sleep, or particularly in REM sleep. We have what we call functional MRIs. You've seen quite a few of these over the last couple of days. And how they work is that we look at the blood flow to the brain. And where there's a lot of blood flow, there's a lot of activity, so we get heat. So we have beautiful yellow, red, hot areas of the brain, and we have the blue-green, cold parts of the brain where there's not much activity happening. You can see these two brains very similar. I mean, I have people sit down and really dissect the brains, but overall, there's a pretty similar level of activity. So it might surprise you that the brain on the left is the awake brain and the brain on the right is the REM brain. So the brain is really, really busy when we're sleeping. So to understand a little bit more exactly what the brain's busy doing is I need to look at a cartoon of the brain. 
Apologies to neurologists and neuroscientists in the audience. I find the brain very complex, so I work with a cartoon. Okay, so there's a couple of structures I want to point out. The hippocampus, it's a very deep structure in the brain, very old. It's responsible for our memory. If we don't have a functioning hippocampus, we won't be able to uh, form or retain new memories. It's the first part of the brain to show damage in the dementia process. The amygdala, this is a centre, very old, very deep, and it's responsible for our emotional learning. So if we have, say for example, um, something that scares us, this is where we will remember it. If something makes us happy, this is where we will remember it. So we have a lot of crosstalk between the amygdala and the hippocampus because mo our most powerful memories are our emotional memories. So if we have a really happy time at a picnic, we remember the facts of the picnic, but we also remember the emotion. If we have something really scary, we have the facts of the scary event and we have the emotion. So these two um, structures work very much hand in hand. There's another structure, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is just behind the prefrontal cortex, which has been spoken about a bit in the last couple of days. And this is responsible for our social interaction. It makes us a social being. It prevents us from acting out from our emotional center, and we tend to put it through this barrier, this gating mechanism that makes us check back. Does this event really have to react this much to it? So it makes us very social, the anterior cingulate cortex. It gates our emotional behaviour. The last structure I want to talk about is indeed the um, prefrontal cortex here. And this is the most newly evolved part of the brain. Most animals don't have one. Um, only the higher order primates have it, and humans have the most highly evolved, highly developed. Now, this is the area of the brain that's responsible for our higher order thinking and our ability to abstract reason. All right, so the reason I've brought this up is I have highlighted three of those structures. The structure important for memory, for emotion, and for our social interaction in red. They're in red because they are more active in rapid eye movement sleep than they are when we were awake. An incredible feat, right? More active in rapid eye movement than when we were awake. And that part of the brain that's responsible for our high order thinking is deactivated. So how does it play out when we choose not to have the right amount of sleep? How does it play out in our functioning the next day? Well, it turns out that the prefrontal cortex is in fact very vulnerable to lack of sleep. And they found this out with this wonderful experiment. So they took a group of people whose average sleep out time was just over seven hours, and another group of people whose average sleep time was about six. One hour difference. Now think about how much sleep you get. So what they did is they were inquired to perform a very difficult cognitive task, and while they were doing that, they were doing functional MRIs. What they came up with were these two pictures of the brain. The brain on the left is gorgeous. How activated is that prefrontal cortex? That area of the brain responsible for our good thinking is on fire. Fantastic. The brain on the right, I actually wouldn't want that person as my surgeon. Okay, if you're going to get operate on me, I want the brain on the left because it's highly activated. Not surprisingly, that brain is the well-slept brain and the brain on the right is the poorly slept brain. Right, so that's how much it affects our ability to think. Not only that, you can see the area that we talked about, the anterior cingulate cortex, it's not activated either. So what's happening is this person is not being a social being, but they're acting from their emotional centre. So that's not a big deal sometimes if an event is fun. And so we'll overreact to the funny event. So that might be a little bit annoying, but instead of something being a little bit funny, it's really, really funny. But what happens when someone annoys you? You're not just annoyed by them, you hate them. You want to kill them. Right? And that's the road rage situation we get. And so this person who is very emotionally labile, it makes it very hard to have a professional or a personal relationship with them. But not only does poor sleep make us um, a poor thinker and a poor behaviour, behavior, but it also um, gives us a very skewed opinion on the world. So we know for a long time that if you don't sleep well, you don't remember well. But exactly what don't you remember? So a group of researchers actually looked at this question and what they did with a group of people, they gave them a positive images, negative images and neutral images. They then divided the group into two one that had as much sleep as they wanted, and the other group that was totally sleep deprived. 
And what they found was, not surprisingly, the well-slept group remembered all images much better than the poorly slept group. But what was really interesting in this study is that the people who um, were poorly slept actually didn't remember positive images very well. They only, they sort of compared to the well-slept people, they had far, far less recall of positive images, but guess what? They remembered the bad stuff. They actually preferentially remembered the bad stuff and neither brain actually remembered the neutral stuff. So from an evolutionary term, this is really important because if in the cave I've gone out to do some um, hunting and gathering or gathering as I would have done in those days and I found a red berry and the berry made me sick, I have to remember that because that's essential for my survival. What I don't have to remember is along the way I had saw, I saw a gorgeous sunrise or a gorgeous flower. It's not important. So I'm going to remember the negative stuff. So it's not surprising that lack of sleep is highly associated with the onset of depression. And in fact, studies have shown that if you don't sleep well enough, you have a five-fold increase in the risk of developing depression. So not only is poor sleep poor for our physical health, it's poor for our cognitive health and for our sense of well-being. Now, despite the evidence, and I could go on, you're lucky I've only got 18 minutes, I could go on because there's so much evidence highlighting the need for sleep. But people still say to me, oh, it's all right for you, Carmel. I haven't got time. And they live their life like the white rabbit. So if I'm not enough and the science isn't enough, maybe Ariana Huffington is enough. Now, this person, this woman, had an epiphany. She came home, very powerful woman in the media. She came home one, one day and face-planted. And she collapsed from exhaustion and sleep deprivation. And she found out, she then became an evangelist to sleep for sleep. And she chronicles her journey in the book Thrive. Now, I'm not recommending that you buy her book. I'd much prefer you bought mine. It's in the bookshop, okay? <laughs> However, I do echo her words. Thrive and get some sleep, my darlings. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. If you go to this uh, supermarket and shouting, I want to buy peace of mind, then people laughing, or people feel that person's mind is something wrong. <laughs> now this word connections is a really interesting one, because our kids today are more connected than ever. Of course, then when you're in, a, in an institution, people call you up, <laughs> they tell you to perk up. Yeah, perk up, because I didn't think of that. I should have a happiness project, I decided. As soon as I have some free time, I'm going to do that.